Okay. Um, can everyone hear hear me fine? Sounds good. Um, thank you very much for showing up. <laughs> w w when we saw initially about 100 people signing up for this session, we figured out, okay, probably we'll have to take the keynotes room or something like that. <laughs> but right now it seems quite optimal. So um, uh, today we'll do a 45 minutes uh, overview of what one may do with uh, OpenStack and VMware being in the same room, being in the same environment. So we'll do a little bit of a slide where no this, no this by PowerPoint, I promise. Uh, we'll do a demo at the very end, and uh, we'll discuss about uh, use cases. So uh, the main question is why, given the OpenStack in the environment, given different hypervisors available, why ma one may want to integrate with VMware and which use cases are better enabled in a such way. Um, so uh, before we begin, a quick round of introductions, and I will actually start with my co-presenters. I'm Santos. I'm a product manager at VMware. I'm a product manager for OpenStack. It doesn't work? Oh, it's work. Yeah. It works. It's good. Hi, guys. My name is Evgenia. Uh, I'm from Mirantis, and I run partner integration team. So I was my team was the one who made sure that Mirantis OpenStack distro actually supports VMware as, a, as another technology. As one of the beautiful options. So yeah. uh, I'm Dmitry Nowakowski. I'm a sales engineer. So I work in the field in different places, originally based in Ukraine, but haven't been there for quite a long time. Uh, I work with customers, and that's why I like to talk about use cases, because I mean, it's great to integrate things with each other. Uh, it's much more interesting to see how these things work together. So um, the first question uh, to go through is actually why? as I was starting. So uh, OpenStack, as you all know, is uh, a technology which allows uh, one to combine a number of technologies uh, in the data center under the same API. So it may be a number of hypervisors, a number of uh, storage technologies, a number of network technologies. And uh, it all comes down to specific features, to specific features which uh, your environment needs from a VMware hypervisor, maybe from an Oracle VM to run some Oracle stuff and so on. So um, before, uh, before we go into use cases, I actually want to do a quick quiz. So please raise your hand uh, if you have some of VMware's products in your infrastructure. You guys are doing good business. <laughs> um, okay, please raise your hand uh, if you have an OpenStack installation in your infrastructure and it's beyond POC, so it's running some real stuff. We're getting there. <laughs> And uh, please raise your hand if you tried, have, if you already played with integrating the two, so OpenStack and VMware. Oh. As I said, we're getting there. Um, so uh, let's take a look at a couple use cases. So these are the ones which we see in the field and which uh, actually generate, which, which we've seen generating a lot of customer interest. That's why we in Mirantis and VMware and a bunch of other folks are investing into getting uh, VMware's hypervisor properly, properly support, uh, supported in our deployment toolkits. So number one is from where the whole thing started with OpenStack actually is a developer enablement. So in such use case, what we usually see is that the company is happily running some infrastructure using VMware. So for example, vCenter with vSphere obviously, some maybe vSAN, maybe some other storage back in it, and some workloads already working without cloud enablement on top. And uh, the organization becomes interested in enabling developers with like all this agile DevOps kind of self-service style to, to be able to provision stuff on uh, this infrastructure without needing to interact with admins all the time. So uh, that's actually the business, drivers, business driver which comes to customers and they come, come in and say, okay, so we want all this like DevOps style, developer en enablement style, development agility. And that's when that's one of the scenarios where dropping in OpenStack on top of existing infrastructure with VMware, which is already running, uh, becomes like a good way to do a first step and to enable developers with OpenStack APIs. The second use case, which is actually my favorite one, uh, is uh, what we call heterogeneous infrastructure. So um, 
as I was saying earlier, uh, with OpenStack, uh, you can unite, you can combine different technologies under the same management umbrella. The OpenStack API, OpenStack frontend, and so on and so forth. And given that, it becomes possible to have number of hypervisors in the environment. For example, KVM to run some type A workloads. VMware to run some type B workloads, which run better on VMware. Oracle VM to run Oracle stuff and get a certified configuration. And all still managed under the same uh, roof of OpenStack. So that's the heterogeneous infrastructure. And well, <laughs> um, I've been talking about use cases and I always like to show this guy. Um, so it's like in uh, our domain, people often talk about integrating this and that without clearly defining why. So that's kind of, uh, I, I keep reminding myself with these guys that it's not like we just integrate these things, we just, we, we need to actually support some certain use cases and understand why we do it, not just put, put things together. Um, and the third, uh, the main one which we will expand uh, on today is uh, catering to application needs. Uh, since different applications, different workloads have different requirements from what they expect from infrastructure, from what they want infrastructure to handle for them or what they can handle by themselves. And uh, that's also a use case in real enterprises when uh, some company has a VMware infrastructure, runs some stuff on it, wants to have some other types of hypervisors and technologies sitting nearby, but still unite them under the same management, management umbrella. So as you can see, these are like three sides of the same coin, although it's not very, not the way how it works. So <laughs> the use cases are quite closely related and coupled, uh, coupled, but the business drivers are usually different. So at this point we come to actually the problem, and I will turn over to Santosh in a second. Uh, so uh, the problem with the use case number three, which we, are go which we are going to dig deeper now. And the problem sounds like, um, okay, so uh, I have in my organization, I have a number of development tracks, developing the applications which have been around, for example, for quite some years, even before the cloud arrived. And I also have some developers which ran on AWS and which do all these D DevOps and continuous integration style. How do I make all of them happy with a single private cloud? And that's what we are actually going to elaborate on. So with this, I'm turning it over to Santosh. Hello. Thanks, Dimitri. Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. So before I jump into like the different types of apps and what the actual problem is, I want to talk about a user story to kind of set the context. So I was talking to this customer like who's a telecom company. I'm not allowed to bring up the name here, so let's just say a telecom company. And they're running two data centers. One data center they use uh, where the developers, they, they kind of, uh, they go have fun developing mobile backends or uh, scale out web applications and stuff like that. And they have another data center dedicated for running IT workloads, which the IT has been building up over a period of time. And now they're trying to uh, kind of manage both these data centers using a same management platform using the same infrastructure uh, provider, and they chose OpenStack. So the point here is, enterprises over time they've kind of uh, they have different applications that have different needs, and they're looking for tools that help them manage the different applications which have different needs using the same uh, uh, same tools, same management tools. So looking at applications, they, you can classify ap applications broadly into two different uh, uh, two different types. One is the cloud-ready applications, the cloudy applications. So what do I mean by cloud-ready applications? These are applications that are aware of the fact that they are running on a cloud infrastructure, and they exploit this fact to be massively distributed, which means based on demand, they, they can automatically uh, scale out. If there is more demand, they can spin up more instances, more virtual machines to scale up. And when there's less demand, they can scale down. Uh, they are stateless, which means they don't have any local data, they don't have any local cache or data, which gives them kind of implicitly HA, which means if an instance go down, goes down, nothing wrong, you can uh, automatically, the application spins up another instance to take its place and there is no downtime. So these are cloud-ready applications and these applications are happy running on cloud, like your internal cloud on OpenStack or AWS. And the other type of application is the classic application. So enterprises, as I mentioned earlier, like over time they've built up applications that need some kind of guarantees in terms of reliability and availability from the infrastructure. And these applications, if you look at them, they're typically not very distributed. They're, they run out of a single virtual machine or maybe two virtual machines. And 
they don't because they're not distributed they cannot scale out on demand whenever there is need for increased capacity you have to manually add more cpus or add more storage or add more memory so you have to scale them up manually and another aspect of uh, classic applications are they they, they process data locally, so they maintain kind of local caches, so they're stateful, they maintain state. And because they're stateful, you cannot afford to lose that state. And that means that to be able to maintain that state and to be able to provide high availability, these applications depend on the underlying infrastructure to do that. Uh, which means you cannot just take that stateful, the classic applications and not throw them on a cloud that does not guarantee or that does not provide reliability or, uh, or availability guarantees. So what do we do? We have, like, what do we do with classic applications? Obviously, we need a single uh, 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 management tool to be able to manage both cloud-ready and classic applications. One option is we could throw all the classic applications out and just live with uh, uh, cloud-ready applications. And if, <laughs> and if I suggest that, most of you are going to think that uh, I'm a stupid person giving a stupid idea, and you'll be right. And so we cannot do that. So you cannot just throw your existing classic applications out. And the other option is you can rewrite all your existing classic applications to be cloud ready. There are like a lot of guidelines, uh, stuff online to rewrite that. But the point is like you don't want to like rewrite, redesign, tinker with your application to be able to fit what the infrastructure gives you. You just have you just have to be able to write your applications to do what they do best and leave stuff like reliability guarantee, uh, uh, reliability and availability to the infrastructure to provide to you. Say, for example, one really good example is NFV, Network Function Visualization. So uh, in simple terms, what you do is you take all your network functions, like routers, firewalls, and you virtualize them. And these, these are good at doing uh, network-related functions, like firewall does firewalling, router does routing, so on and so forth. And you don't want to like worry about having to build HA into it and fault tolerance into it. And you want to let these applications do what they do best and leave the rest to uh, uh, the underlying infrastructure. So some applications, you, you just don't want to rewrite them. They're not meant to be rewritten to be cloud style. They, they expect the guarantees from the uh, infrastructure. And the other problem with rewriting is it's expensive, both in terms of time and money. If you're like Mr. Scrooge, if you have all the money in the world, all the time in the world, and if you can, uh, most importantly, if you can ask your uh, uh, customers to hold on to what they're doing until you rewrite your applications and then come back to you, then maybe you could rewrite. But there's a lot of time and money involved in rewriting these classic applications to be cloud ready. So Back to square one. We have this nice tool, OpenStack, which gives really nice APIs to manage your infrastructure. And how do we use this OpenStack to manage both your classic applications and your cloud-ready applications? And to tell you how, I'll hand it over to Evgeny. OK. OK, yeah, I guess you can hear me. So we have three co-presenters, like it's mess, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the solution, about how actually can we do and marry like VMware and uh, traditional hypervisors like KVM in one cloud. And um, you know, guys, like we have a huge presence of VMware in OpenStack community, and the whole OpenStack team, like VMware team, they contribute a lot. Um, and actually, OpenStack community embraces it. So there are a lot of work was done in Nova, Cinder, Neutron, uh, which is amazing. So yeah, and we have like different types of drivers and plugins there. So actually, and this uh, this is how like. Uh, the whole like OpenStack ecosystem that enables and integrates VMware uh, VMware solution looks like looks like okay we have Nova and for Nova we have vCenter driver so as you prob as you know guys I'd like especially those who actually have this uh, VMware plus OpenStack clouds in place yeah um, you know that actually Nova compute driver works through uh, vCenter API and manages ESXi clusters. Not just ESXi itself, but the, the, group, of, the group of ESXi's. And Nova considers this, uh, uh, this ESXi cluster as, a, as actually like one compute node. Um, this is how it works, and actually, it's, uh, it provides you a lot of like nice features with that. Uh, there is a Cinder driver, uh, which is like VMDK, so it allows you to use um, vSphere data store as a 
as a backend for uh, for Cinder, and as a real backend, you can you can have vSAN or EMC storage or whatever. So it's it depends on how your actually vSphere cluster is configured. Written below vSphere. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, glance. So for Glance, the same VMDK driver, but for storing images and um, getting getting them to like to the cloud. Uh, for Neutron, uh, there is an NSX driver. You know, guys, the SDN is a buzzword in OpenStack, so uh, VMware has NSX solution, which is a kind of really nice fit if, you, if you're if you enabling VMware for OpenStack, because this is the same family of technologies, like it's it's all from VMware. So looking at this picture, you can see like the best of the breed if you are, to if you are talking about like uh, how to uh, how to bring like VMware to your OpenStack cluster, but it doesn't mean that like this is the only option you see. Uh, okay, so uh, having these uh, all these drivers and plugins, uh, you will be able to uh, to install OpenStack on top of it and manage uh, through OpenStack APIs VM, uh, VMware virtual resources. And um, moving forward and answering the question how actually to build heterogeneous cloud and how it usually looks like. So here is the very like typical picture of uh, deployments that um, our customers are usually looking for. So what they really need, they, uh, they really want, they want to see both, for example, KVM and vCenter as hypervisors in their, one in, in their cloud, just one single cloud. Sometimes they, they want to have two clouds, so but it's not a heterogeneous cloud anymore. Uh, so you see, we have some compute nodes responsible for managing KVM and a uh, couple of compute, compute nodes managing actually ESXi clusters via vCenter. Uh, you don't see the networking part here, but let's assume it's NSX and NSX driver or NSX plugin. Um, also, if you want to play, you we always can use Nova Network, but it's not for production, so everybody knows that. Uh, and um, how t how we usually um, solve the this problem on how how to distinguish these compute nodes and compute resources? Usually, you can do it using host aggregates, availability zones, uh, or even different types of images. So. Also, we have regions and, cel and cells, but usually uh, what we offer is like different availability zones for different types of compute resources. Uh, and uh, I guess I guess that's it uh, <laughs> for my part. Uh, I'm going to pass the ball to Santosh, and he's going to talk a bit more about VMware and and uh, and applications that can run on that part of OpenStack Cloud. So please go ahead. Thanks, Evgeny. Thanks, guys. Before I jump into that, like how many of you were at the keynote yesterday when they rolled in the BMW i8? <coughs> cool car, eh? So towards the end of his speech, uh, Stefan Lair, he, he made a very good point. He mentioned that OpenStack is just one tool in your toolkit to be able to build your cloud, but you need more than OpenStack to have a, a reliable cloud running. And I kind of liked it when he said that because I was, I was not uh, planning on leveraging that, but I, I was now that I have a good point to lead into my talk. So what are the other pieces that you need to build your cloud apart from OpenStack? So OpenStack gives you the nice consumption layer uh, with APIs and it abstracts services into compute network and storage. But you need something underlying. You need, uh, you need a hypervisor to, uh, for your compute. And vSphere gives you HA uh, for your applications when they need it. it. It gives you fault tolerance for your applications when they have to keep running without any downtime when, uh, uh, when, the, when the applications in your instances dies or when, when a host goes away, you need uh, some kind of reliability guarantees. And vSphere gives, you, gives that to you with HA, DRS, and vMotion. And going back to this keynote, when Matt Haynes from Time Warner Cable, he was, talk, uh, he was talking about what kind of uh, 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 features they were looking for when they built this cloud. What, like, one of the important points he had up on his slide was, uh, high availability and DR. So these are features that are important to build your clouds to be able to provide the kind of guarantees that your applications need. And vSphere provides all of that to you. And for applications that 
or that need networking functionality, like for applications that want to like deploy networks automatically, like network functions like routers, firewalls. NSX provides a highly scalable network uh, virtualization software. So applications can use that to uh, leverage the underlying infrastructure to dynamically create networks, routers, and uh, uh, use them for uh, for their applications. And on the storage side, Virtual SAN provides a, a cost-effective uh, 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 distributed SAN uh, uh, virtual uh, SAN-based storage, which uh, based on uh, 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 solid-state devices uh, combined with your spinning disks to provide a cost-effective storage solution for your application. You can you can do things with uh, vSAN like uh, uh, you can create sto a tiered architecture, like tiered storages where you can have different types of storage and tie instances to them. And this is just the infrastructure. Right? Now you have the infrastructure and you've deployed OpenStack and you have a cloud and up and running, but that's not the end of it. You need tools to be able to manage and operate your cloud. And that that's provided with vCenter operations and login site where you can use these tools to manage your OpenStack cloud. You can use the same tools that you use to manage your vSphere cloud, your vSphere tools, the same vCenter operations and login site you can now use to uh, troubleshoot and operate your uh, OpenStack cloud. With that, we jump into the demo and I give it back Finally. to the mystery. <laughs> We've actually checked a bunch of demos which were done on the last summit, and we decided that ours will be pre recorded. Just too many surprises. Okay. Oh. Not, not okay. hopes and stuff, but yes, it's not a lot. <laughs> okay, so, uh, as, I, as we were saying, and we'll say later today, there is a number of tools and uh, ready-to-use toolkits which you can deploy uh, OpenStack with VMware already. So there is an offering from VMware, there is an offering from Mirantis, Canonical folks also say that they have something around this. So what's important to understand is that all these solutions are using the same drivers from upstream. So that's just the question of who kind of does the nicer installation. And here in this demo, I'm actually running two uh, ESXi nodes on this laptop using nested virtualization. I also have a vCenter appliance and I have uh, a shared storage backend with NFS to power the live migration for me. So here you see the horizon on the admin page on hypervisors Outlook and you see the only one hypervisor. And this hypervisor is the instance of Nova Compute's vCenter driver which exposes behind itself two ESXi hypervisors. That's what's important to understand. OpenStack right now consumes uh, VMware's hypervisor as a black box. So it knows how to talk to it, but doesn't know what's happen what happens inside. Well, knows, but to some extent. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing the beautiful hypervisor, and then I'm probably showing the vSphere client. So this is the admin interface of uh, vCenter. And you can see here that I have two ESXi nodes two ESXi nodes under this uh, vCenter cluster. So I have HA, uh, high availability, enabled uh, for this cluster. What does HA for a virtual machine means? If virtual machine goes down, or if the entire hypervisor goes down, then vCenter and vSphere will work on restarting this virtual machine from a shared storage as soon as possible. Um, here I actually did a, a bit of learning myself and I found that uh, there are two options for doing HA. One is host monitoring, second one is VM monitoring. So for VM monitoring you need a virtual machine with VMware tools installed inside and in such case vSphere will be able to monitor a very specific VM. In case it goes down it will be possible to restore it. Uh, host monitoring is for restarting all the VMs which were on a somehow died uh, SXI node. Um, also, 
Here I have, uh, for this cluster, I have enabled DRS. So DRS is a distributed resource scheduling. Uh, this is the mechanism which allows a vSphere cluster to uh, balance and rebalance the virtual machine among its XI nodes, given that there is a shared storage and it's possible to migrate them between the nodes. Uh, that's actually something which people often ask from OpenStack and it's not there. Um, and also for this cluster, I have enabled the vMotion. So this is VMware's native uh, live migration for virtual machines, uh, which given the presence of shared storage in my setup allows me to move one virtual machine from host A to host B, hopefully without downtime. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm going back to OpenStack Horizon and I'm creating a new virtual machine. So. Um, since it's a virtualized environment, I'm not very heavy on resources, and I'm using just a small image with Cirrus, uh, enough to demonstrate that it can stay alive while running on VMware. So I launch it, and yeah, uh, full disclosure. So since the setup is quite small, uh, I used iMovie to stitch some points. So it not, it's not always that fast as it shows here, so it takes some time. And uh, the virtual machine lands to vSphere. So right now in vSphere web client, I can see that it's actually running here. And uh, right now, well, at least in my setup of OpenStack, I couldn't get a no VNC console from uh, Horizon. So in order to get to console, I'm actually using vSphere's native console. Um, now what I'm doing is I'm assigning a floating IP to this machine to be able to ping it from my host. So from that point, I will be using this ping as a, like an indication whether machine is alive or not yet, or already not alive. So right now it's alive. Um, probably next I will do live migration, yes. So now I go back to vSphere and I say, okay, probably I need to move this virtual machine to another host on whatever reason. Maybe I want to do some maintenance. And I go through the native VMware's uh, native uh, vSphere's uh, live migration flow. So here I, I actually have two hosts uh, in this cluster. If I would have multiple clusters or multiple hosts, I would be able to point to a specific cluster where I want this machine to migrate or otherwise leave it to vSphere to decide where this virtual machine will go. What's important is that OpenStack has no idea that this is happening. So vSphere is playing uh, internally with uh, placement of virtual machines. Um, I know on which on which host it's ru it runs at the moment, so I will just select a different host to do the migration. And I say yes, let's do it. I was hesitant. Gonna lie. I come back to ping, and on the top on the top right of the screen you see the progress. So it's been moved to another host at the moment. And luckily I'm not losing a single packet. So uh, in this quite slow setup, actually if I do 10 live migrations, two of them will lose one packet. In real world, it's not supposed to happen. And now I'm doing the most evil part of the demo. I'm killing one of the hypervisors. So I just migrated, uh, I, I run a nested virtualization with VMware Fusion. So I just migrated a virtual machine to uh, hypervisor two and I'm killing it. So I'm just shutting it down like it went out of power. So it's dead. I will show that ping is lost. Yes, it's lost. So uh, from this point, vSphere kind of quickly catches up with the fact, oh, it's, it's a stitch. Uh, vSphere quickly catches up with the fact that it lost one of the hypervisors and it uh, migrates the virtual machines to a different one, to surviving one. Uh, it is, this is not fault tolerance, so there is some time when machine is actually down, which takes for uh, vSphere to do the actual migration. Um, in my virtualized setup, it was taken actually up to the couple of minutes. In real world, it's working faster on hardware, uh, on real hardware. Uh, another option is to do fault tolerance here. So it's not on the demo, but I want to say a couple of words uh, that for a virtual machine, which is provisioned from OpenStack and runs on vSphere, it is possible here to do like the right click and enable fault and enable fault tolerance protection for it. 
This will mean that uh, basically vSphere will run uh, will run a sort of a clone of this virtual machine with less restart consumption on another hypervisor. And in case if primary hypervisor dies, it's, it will quickly switch over to another one with, with hopefully no downtime down, down at all. Um, vSphere didn't like the storage which I used in this demo, so I couldn't unfortunately record the fault tolerance, maybe next year. Um, so here, the, v, uh, the virtual machine came to another host. To another host, you can see that there was some some packets which were actually lost during this process because again, HA it's not no downtime. It's as as few downtime as possible for a virtual machine, and it's back alive. Yep. So. Um, as I was saying, uh, the whole the whole point and the whole interest from my side of integrating OpenStack and VMware was to give the answer to the question of uh, many customers and prospects who are saying, okay, I have some applications which have been developed in a classic manner, like Santosh explained. How do I make sure that I don't get them killed if I start using OpenStack? So that's basically one of the answers. You can use VMware on, uh, in parallel, you can buy some new licenses or re reuse existing one, ones. And use them, utilize the utilize VMware part of the infrastructure to help the applications which need more support from the infrastructure. Um, okay, so that's it with the demo. You're welcome to ask the questions in a couple of minutes. The last section here is the last section from me here is not 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 the demo. I'm done with the demo. Um, how to get? So as I was saying at the very beginning right now, uh, multiple companies, and we are proud to be one of the first, at Mirantis uh, work on enabling their deployment toolkit to, toolkits to work with VMware. So in Mirantis, uh, there is a number of options how you can do it already today. So number one, and kind of the one which you obviously will see being a VMware user, is you can consume uh, VMware integrated OpenStack, VO. That was that's the product which was was, was announced earlier this year, right? Uh, is it still in beta or already in GA? It's still in beta. Yes. Still in beta. Okay. Q1 of next year. Q1. Okay. Good. Uh, number two is uh, Mirantis is partnering with VMware since Hong Kong Summit, and uh, we're in, we're doing the same the same kind of the similar kind of integration in our distribution, Mirantis OpenStack. So we enable deployment of cl OpenStack clusters combined with uh, vCenter as a hypervisor. We enable connect connection of Cinder as a block storage to as a block storage to vCenter, and we enable a certain use cases with NSX as well. The long term, the stretch, the long term goal and the stretch goal is to have the automated scenario of deployment of heterogeneous clouds. Right now, we do it yet through some configuration adjustments as well. And if you feel adventurous, you can also always go with do it yourself. The drivers are in upstream. The documentation is out there. So if you like building things from bottom to the top, I liked it once. I was using Gen2 Linux, so you can go with do it yourself as well. Um, Okay, so that's all with the slideware and uh, videoware. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions. We have questions. Thanks for that. Um, I think the biggest problem in terms of this kind of context when we have tried to have a mix of different type of private cloud system in, in, in one framework, the networking part is really headache and you networking. Said, you yeah, said networking. networking. Yeah, networking. Um, so you assume that actually NSX already utilized that. What if we don't use NSX? We use just VShield or some t traditional, you know, other type of uh, solution. Then how how we can deal with uh, the networking part? I told you that will be the first question. You want? Do you want to start? That's all. <laughs> 
So uh, yes, in this presentation, we are using NSX as a reference on one simple reason, it but it's battle tested. So VMware has been doing it, we've been doing it. But uh, we, uh, we at Mirantis, we kind of strive to enable as much choice as possible, and we track other folks such as PlumGrid, some just Nuage, and other network virtualiza virtualization technologies to see uh, and to elaborate on working stories of multi-hypervisor environment with uh, different options for networking, not only NSX. But NSX is battle tested, it works now, so that's why it gets promoted. Uh, in next, six months in Kilo cycle, I would assume that uh, there may be also an open source uh, solution available, uh, given some developments in SDN right now. And well, obviously, I mean, VMware looks at the market, Mirage just looks at the market, so this is, today the safe bet is NSX. In six months, I guess we will have some more diversity and it's good for the market, it's good for VMware as well. Any other questions? Uh, well, I had two. The first was about NSX, uh, so that that's done. Uh, the second was about uh, legacy, uh, because in many use cases, uh, customers they want to have OpenStack off top of VMware, but they want also OpenStack to be able to manage all the VMs that are already existing, and that's sometimes quite a nightmare, uh, especially for the networking part. But even just to have the discovery features to be able just to see the VMs at first and just to you know be able to uh, kill them when they don't want them anymore so is there i mean some solutions right now or do we have to wait more that's actually a, ver a very good question and i didn't did not anticipate it uh the, m the even more interesting aspect of it is that uh, vm in vmware in pure vmware environment and a vm in openstack are also slightly different concepts right so in OpenStack, you run them from images as a templates or from uh, block devices as kind of already pre-set up uh, and some more configured and with some persistent, persistent data templates. And in VMware, by default, you create a virtual machine and you just install stuff on it. So that's actually a very interesting question. And I'm looking on Santosh to figure out whether you guys have already thought about this problem. With open uh, the instance of the base mode, and you know, on on the VSphere side, like you are free to create VMs of any size that you want. So when you want to migrate them to OpenStack, so if you don't have a matching flavor, what do you do? So if you don't have a, a matching feature on OpenStack, what do you do? So it's it's something it's hard to automate. It it can obviously be done manually. Like we've we've done it in a couple of cases, but it's more of a uh, white cloud, very close engagement. But we don't have a tool to do that automatically because. Okay, and uh, just to finish on that, uh, so that's for VMs, and what about networking? For instance, if someone tells me uh, I want to use my vSwitch configuration that I'm used to in my ESX, um, what's your advice there? Do you buy NSX or do you go with something else? <laughs> okay, uh, I, I mean, without NSX. Without it, NSX. Yeah. So without NSX, if I understand correctly, you just want to be able to use your vSwitch with OpenStack. So with the current product in beta, we have a driver for the vSwitch as well. It will be upstream, so it's, it's not just specific to the product. It will be upstreamed and when it's accepted, reviewed and accepted, you'll be able to get that upstream too. But it will be available before it goes upstream in the product because it's, it's our product and we can push it in. Yep. So um, the driver for DVS, the standard switch which is running on ESXi nodes, uh, that's kind of uh, elaborating further on the answer of if I don't have NSX. So obviously with a setup like this, you'll have less capabilities and less flexibility on what any SDN gives you, like with logical networks on demand and services injected inside. But if you just need to run VMs, probably the option of running with the driver which folks will upstream for DVS is even better than running with Nova Network. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, uh, I work for a large company doing a lot of uh, enterprise application hosting on, on VMware and all these legacy things. And we are just starting with OpenStack projects. Uh, I wonder why would we do it? Why? What would be the motivation to uh, to merge OpenStack and VMware world? 
what's the what's the benefit for the customer? Are you seeing are you seeing uh, customer cases run operating SAP clouds, uh, Oracle applications, and all these uh, legacy enterprise applications? being managed through OpenStack, and if, if, if so, then why? Um, imagine a use case when, um, the use case number one, which I was actually talking about, so developer enablement. You have a VMware infrastructure, which you happily run, and it works great, you have the licenses, you don't, I mean, it's good for you in terms of like costs and so on and so forth. But all, but all of a sudden you get this new team of the developers who want to deploy applications in a cloud way. And maybe they also use some kind of a public cloud like Rackspace or, or, well, it's not a public cloud anymore, uh, like AWS, for example. And they want to run a private cloud as well. And you don't want to buy a bunch of hardware for them to uh, run their isolated cluster on KVM. So you connect an OpenStack to VMware. You give them some quota on VMware hypervisors, on VMware storage, on VMware networking. And you still get them managed through the tools which you are familiar with. For example, VCOps, Operation Manager. But they will not come to you and fill the tickets, okay, create a virtual machine for me, create something else for me, uh, increase me the quota, and so on. They will go through OpenStack API and through OpenStack uh, user interface in a completely self-service manner. But your existing and uh, happy infrastructure will serve them. Okay, thanks, but when thinking of running the existing installation and uh, supposing that there is no import process for importing what's already running, then it means that uh, I would have to, I would need to have a big motivation to really do it, uh, supposing that I will have to reinstall and redeploy everything uh, through OpenStack to, uh, to the VMware background. Yeah, yeah. Th that's why I'm asking for the experience and the motivation why people might be doing this. Thanks. Well, uh, I mean, uh, being completely blunt, one of our customers uh, didn't want to buy vCloud. Sorry. <laughs> And uh, they have been using, and they are still using a very, ex very extensive setup of vCenters and vSphere's, and uh, they were quite nice. But they wanted to do this develop, develop developer enablement thing, which I was talking about. So they got a few new development tracks, which needed private cloud capabilities. But there was no kind of the cost the company evaluated and decided that they don't want to go one more step up the stack with uh, enabling the cloud through vCloud. They decided that for API and self-service yeah. part, they want to do OpenStack. Yeah. And we're doing it for them. Yeah. So, And they actually didn't care that much about importing existing running stuff. So there is an intention, for example, later to investigate some virtual machines which are running there, which have been put there through the usual admin process, like create a ticket and so on and so forth. There is an intention to investigate, okay, let's do a block device snapshots, let's import this stuff to OpenStack, let's reinstantiate it as an OpenStack managed virtual machine, but it's not the top priority one. The top priority one is to make developers work faster. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. There are quite a few uh, things which are being sublimated into the hypervisor at vSphere 6 from vCloud Director. <laughs> Um, what's the plan there for the OpenStack enablement of those kinds of features? Oh, well, vApps, for example. The product is presently done. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The OpenStack product is obviously being developed. It's kind of too early to think about like what features would be exposed through OpenStack. So for those of us that are on the vSphere 6 beta, then there's, then there's nothing we can currently do with you? Upstream OpenStack, you can also, I mean, all the OpenStack code and drivers are available. Sure, right? yeah. sure. Software. But but if you're already cutting code, then yeah. So Currently, we are testing it. We are testing our okay. product on uh, vSphere 6 as well. And when we release it, there will be some kind of support guide. But we don't need to right now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going even to try on this question. <laughs> Any other questions? We're running five minutes late, but if you folks have questions, we're, we're glad to answer now or after the talk. One, two, three, 
four, five. Okay, that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here.